I've never seen anything like this in the 10 years I've been in the industry. Just make my life so much easier. It's it's a it's a big issue. In the studio, we have a range of exciting guests from Track Unit, the industry, and partners of Track Unit. And I'm super excited to dive in. Warm welcome to uh, this episode uh, where we are exploring how AI is shaping construction. My name is Lærke Ullerup. I'm Track Unit's Chief Product and Marketing Officer, and I'm hosting a discussion with uh, a lineup of excellent people who are sharing some insights and reflections on this topic. Today in uh, the studio, we're going to focus on the future of AI in construction. And uh, to discuss this topic, we've invited Track Unit CEO Soren Brogart to uh, join us here. So happy to have you here, Soren. Great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. So today we're going to zoom in and, and try to understand what is going on. So could you try and give us your point of view in terms of the current landscape of AI in construction? I'll start by saying that it varies a lot. We tend to think that construction is super undigitized and has a hard time adopting uh, new technology and in particular AI. And I would say in general, it is early days. It, we are at a super early stage. Having said that, we do have autonomous vehicles, autonomous trucks. We do have dynamic pricing uh, for rental firms and uh, autonomy on uh, advanced job sites like mining and, and so forth. So it's a very mixed bag. And it shows you that when uh, you could say the budgets and the project and the conditions are in place, we as an industry can absolutely move to very advanced systems. But high level speaking for the general, you could say user of, uh, of data or software, we are still very, very early. And when you then think about uh, the future, Uh, as we embark on this journey, there is uh, a lot of interest. There is a lot of appetite and yeah. willingness to both invest and experiment mm. and try this out. Yeah. How do you see the future and how do you see the next years uh, unfold uh, in constructions here? I think it's uh, interesting to look at those who are able to um, both experiment and get some real products out and see the real benefits of uh, machine learning, uh, general analytics to improve the customer experiences and driving overall efficiency inside the companies. They do have one thing in common, and that is that they have their data foundation is well structured and it's constraint, it's conditioned uh, uh, you know, towards a, cer a certain use case or a problem to be uh, solved. That's why you can make uh, autonomy vehicles in mining. That's why you can make uh, dynamic pricing if you are large, not a large enough <laughs> rental company that has done this for years and have a lot of data, is able to buy data to, to back it up. If we take that then and bring it into the general industry, uh, into the tier twos of OEMs, into fleet owners, uh, contractors, general contractors, subcontractors, that is for sure not the case. And I think that's really where Uh, I'm getting very excited to see how can we create structure and boundaries and harmonize the data that, get, that is being collected in this highly fragmented, uh, highly unstructured uh, industry where we have very few standards, and uh, but a high willingness to do the right thing uh, and to, to share the data under the right conditions. How can we help um, everyone else take, uh, could take, take uh, advantage of data? Hmm. And what uh, when we think about uh, the outlook then uh, in in the years to come, assuming that you know that we can collect the data, we can harmonize, we have you know all of these things in place. What characterizes those who are the first movers, those who will actually uh, get going here? And uh, on the other side, you know, mm -hmm. those who are lagging behind, you know, what is it that they're not doing? Yeah, so um, uh, I think you can put up uh, sort of three major things you got to get right. Uh, there's certainly a tech element, your tech stack, your tech expertise, and 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 the partners that you bring in to uh, to just have the foundation in place to go do it. 
but there's certainly also uh, the culture, the organization, the way you infuse these type of things from the very early days of experimentation, uh, testing your hypotheses, but very quickly getting that into the broader side of the organization and make the organization comfortable with experimentation. And then I would say that the third thing is is actually the uh, the willingness to have more of a uh, of, of culture of uh, experimentation and failing also at the board and the CEO and at the investor level that um, the times we're heading into now requires a different uh, mindset of clock speed of experimentation. We might actually be uh, looking into a future where the technology is turning over so quickly now that what took us three years to build a new model or a new machine or a new business model, we'll have to reduce that to, to a year, uh, which is very, very demanding uh, in, in a culture uh, or in an industry that is also lacking, attracting uh, the right uh, talent. Mm. And how does one get comfortable with maybe not always getting it right? That's a big question, and I uh, I think it starts from the top. It always has to start from the top. It has to uh, be a willingness to accept a higher degree of risk, a higher degree of failure, and celebrating failures, being comfortable with not having a perfect business plan, a perfect return of investment that mm. everyone uh, needs to be super conservative on so no idea can fly. So we need to start thinking about... Um, the investments, the returns, and you could say the KPIs that assess whatever an idea can fly or not in in a different way. What is a what is a KPI around uh, AI to understand if uh, if there is a potential for a company in construction? I think it depends on how far you are on the maturity of getting to uh, insights driven by AI or generative AI. I, I'll give you an example back from 2016 when. I joined Tregnet for the first time. Uh, back then, we were a European company. We had approximately uh, 80,000 devices connected to our cloud. And I, I hired uh, the very first data scientist because I was absolutely convinced that we had to build great products out of our data. And uh, two weeks into uh, this gentleman's uh, job, he actually came in and said, I'm quitting. You're quitting. You know, why are you quitting? Well, the data is here, but it's not structured. It's not made available. It's a mess. And I, I think that's uh, that was a key learning from back then. That just because you have data doesn't make it usable, doesn't make it actionable, doesn't make it approachable. Um, and even to this day, when I when I look across our our OEM customers who tend to be connecting for three, four, five years, uh, when they look at the the GNAI or our IRSX opportunity they very quickly realize they don't have enough data and that's where the appetite for connecting for life comes in. A little bit like back in 2016 when we realized we had to completely change the way we were structuring and helping our customers get the data into our system in a more uh, disciplined way. And that makes so much sense. And for for the industry, and now you're talking about the OEMs, uh, it could also be rentals or, cost or contractors or the wider ecosystem. Mm. What are the s applications that you're most excited about on behalf of, uh, of the industry? There's a lot of use cases that are popping up uh, left, right, and center. What I'm, what I'm fundamentally most excited about is that our customers are now starting to build their own AI models on top of our platform and our data, that is their IP. Uh, that has been a big trend and a move, uh, a movement, I would say, in the last uh, six to 12 months where they are building their own spare parts, you could say lead generation systems, and they're deploying these applications across the ecosystem. We see uh, rental firms optimizing where to put their uh, machines or their assets based on real-time demand. You see rental firms doing a live dynamic pricing based on historical trends where they are taking our data, but they're also coupling it with data elements from their own operation. So it's becoming a much more, uh, it was a uh, development friendly and experimentation, experimentational friendly environment that we're dealing with now uh, that gives me a, a ton of hope. Um, 
On, on the other side, I think it's also fair to say that we need to be careful that it doesn't get uh, too tech and too complicated, and we need to rely on an army of consultants and uh, super smart data scientists. We need to find a way where you could say business people, data analysts, finance people can work with our data models in, in ways that get them quickly to results. So we are super focused on keep being, uh, finding ways of being ingenious and taking deep tech out of the equation so more people can work mm. with our tech stack. And what are your thoughts around kind of the pace of, you know, how fast can can this go? I mean, it's certainly here, yet it's still somewhat early. Mm. What are your expectations or thoughts about when will yeah. we see these AI applications and products out there? Well, they're already here. They're here. We just don't see them per se. Uh, so when you see a, 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 a plot, a graph, uh, a progression, when you see insights of some sort, Very often there is statistics analysis and AI uh, built into it for sure. So um, the future where a person from college comes in, sits down in a rental office and has a co-pilot or an agent advising him or her on how to do a job that usually takes 20, 15 years of training and experience. That is probably, uh, that's not 10 years out. I think that's maybe three, four, maybe even two years out, where the generative part of uh, allowing uh, untrained people to get the experience in real time, get recommendation, get actions, get feedback uh, on the way they manage the job, I think there's very, very near term um, that our last language models can advise and assist operators in that way. Hmm. Which actually gives me a lot of encouragement because it also hopefully will drive uh, new talent into our industry and also you know bridge the gender gap or the age gap that we are currently experiencing in our industry. And and uh, when we think about some of the barriers that we need to overcome to really speed up uh, the implementation or the uh, adaptation of AI yeah. here. What what should companies be thinking about or doing if they really want to be serious in uh, in this area? Every company is uh, is different. Uh, in, in track unit, we've been thinking, uh, I would say, fairly holistic about this uh, opportunity for for the better part of two years or so, where. We didn't just go down and say, okay, we need to drive internal efficiency. Uh, we need to, you know, code faster, better, write better, faster, and 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 drive sort of the the obvious efficiency game uh, with AI and generative AI. We also immediately challenged ourselves to say, okay, how do our customers benefit from this? Mm. What capabilities can we put into our products, um, and and have that sort of duality in our in our use? And and I think that was that was quite helpful. Uh, to be insisting uh, on that. Um, then I would also say um, be careful uh, not to be too prescriptive on how to use AI. Be careful not to overdo the sort of the IT policy. Create high-level governance and boundaries around uh, do's and don'ts, but let your organization free to apply the tools that they see fit for their job. I see very often companies being almost paranoid and very, very afraid for very good reasons, but be uh, be concerned and create the right, create the right, the right governance models at the right abstraction level, um, and uh, be careful not to get in the way. And maybe talking about uh, governance there for for a little uh, while. What uh, what are your thoughts on the impact of AI on uh, the industry, on society, on humans, uh, on the economy? Mm. Those like really big uh, trends out there. We see how you know forceful technology mm. can be as mm. a driver to to really shake things up. Mm. Mm. Uh, and something we all need to consider. You know, yeah. how do you see this? Well, we've known that for the better part of 50 years or so, construction have been this very flat line productivity uh, improvement curve. And um, we have a hard time attracting talent. We run construction projects at single digit margins. 
we think when we go out and quote them that we are you know, double digit by the time we are done. Uh, we had so much margin, margin leakage that uh, it becomes a real liability for many uh, general contractors and so forth. And I, it, it plays into the complexity of our industry. It plays into the level of skill sets that every project is new. There's very little repeatability in our business. So it is super complex. And that's actually something that AI is uh, uniquely designed to do, to take this vast amount of complexity and uh, you could say feed it with the right level of information to get higher predictability, to get better margins, to get into a, a positive uh, mode. So I think it will be super healthy on the way that we drive and run our projects and create uh, less waste. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a real uh, impact on also emissions and the way we think about the environment um, to constantly not just report on it, but also do something about emissions uh, on construction sites from machines. It's very much our role. And then uh, there is also a, a, a big impact on the skill level and the pace of learning. So getting someone in, fresh out of university that can literally pick up uh, the task or the responsibility of a fleet manager who's 25 years or 30 years into his job or her job, that uh, pace and that assistance uh, is unheard of. And I um, uh, I think that's going to be a real game changer for, for many companies. Here, as we wrap up, is there one last uh, consideration or idea that you would like to leave uh, the listeners with? You can so easily get stuck in the mud with strategic intent, good vision that is hard to get traction around. Um, and very often this traction, one it's, once it's there, there is a high appetite for doing it yourself. Over and over again, we see those who propel, those who move fast, those who partner, those who open up, and they're not super afraid of sharing early on, um, actually tends to uh, get ahead and uh, they tend to learn faster. We talked about the pace of learning. We talked about failing, fa failing fast. Uh, all of these, you could say, innovations one-on-one, uh, -on -one, when you do innovation management than when you drive your R&D uh, team, has just been even more important. Be super close to your customers. Be super crisp on the problem you're trying to solve. As much as you have um, founders around your tech stack, you also have founders around your customers. So being close to customers, uh, go fast, um, and put the right level of investment in is probably uh, my three bet, uh, best uh, recommendations. Amazing. <laughs> Sounds like uh, what a culture of innovation is uh, is made of. Thank you so much for for joining us here, Soren, and uh, discussing uh, the topic of uh, AI and the outlook for construction. And thank you to uh, those of you watching here. Uh, we're exploring uh, AI and construction, uh, and we'll be back with more episodes soon.